We're good to go? All right. Welcome. Um, I am Brian Rosenwald. I'm the director of the Red and Blue Exchange uh, at the PIDEA program here at Penn. Uh, this is our first event of the year. If you're not familiar with PIDEA or RBX, um, we have events. There are PIDEA classes that you should look into. If you're a first year, there is a fellowship program that you want to look into for next year and beyond. Um, and we, we try to bring interesting folks to campus for RBX events to try to give you unique perspectives on critical issues and important topics. Um, and we are thrilled to have Senator Richard Burr with us today. Actually, before I, I get down there, uh, I want to thank the Gamba Family Foundation um, for making RBX possible, as well as the Pidea, Stavros Niarchos Paidea um, Foundation, which makes Paidea possible. Uh, without them, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. Uh, and now to our distinguished guest. We are thrilled to have Senator Richard Burr with us. He is a principal policy advisor and chair of DLA Piper's health policy strategic consulting practice. And the senator spent more than three decades in both the House and Senate, um, including serving as a, both the ranking member of the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, and the chairman of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. His legislative accomplishments are numerous, including the 1997 FDA Modernization Act, the Pandemic All Hazards Preparedness Act, and the Bipartisan Student Loan Certainty Act. So certainly no big issues in those topics. Um, He's one of the foremost experts on both healthcare policy and national security. So we're thrilled to have Senator Burr with us today. And we will, the, you should be, have gotten note cards. Um, and if you have questions, we will get to your questions in a bit, but we will try to cover as much ground as we can. Senator, I wanna start with probably a question you get fairly frequently. It seems like most Americans don't love the medical system, the, the healthcare system whether it's how long it takes to get appointments, fighting with insurers, those kinds of things. And I'm wondering, you know, do you think there's room to improve the system? And if so, how would you go about improving it? Well, one, thank you. And thank, thank you to all of you for coming out tonight. Um, short answer is, yeah, the, the healthcare system desperately needs reform. And if, if I had to point to one thing, if we switch to a value-based healthcare system, uh, where you, reimbursement were determined by the value that you as a patient get out of it, it would drastically change it because then consumers began to affect the price of healthcare. They began to shop healthcare, uh, just like you shop other things uh, today on Amazon. And that's one of the reasons that you're seeing Amazon is one of the biggest players in healthcare space. Uh, they're not there today, but uh, as time goes on, you're gonna see um, that component sort of click in. And part of that's uh, post COVID because in COVID we changed our policies and we did a lot of reimbursements for distance diagnosis. You didn't have to actually physically go to the doctor um, to be prescribed something. Uh, technology allows us to do remote monitoring on a whole slew of disease categories today that quite frankly, three years ago, four years ago, there was no reimbursement. There, the technology was there, but there wasn't a reimbursement. Today, there's a reimbursement for it. And what the reimbursements cause, it's just called the technology to get better, more accurate. And when we talk about just three categories, diabetes, um, uh, congestive heart failure, uh, well, two, diabetes and congestive heart failure, you're talking about probably 40% of all the money in healthcare in two categories. And with remote monitoring, we, we can keep somebody in a blood sugar level that they don't have to be hospitalized. And for a congestive heart patient, uh, we can make sure that we're monitoring what their fluid level is and can be adjusted outside of a emergency room trip and an inpatient care. So, uh, we're on the verge of being able to change. It's more the requirements that we are putting on the medical system today and our willingness not to change. So um, those two things have to come together. And is there something that you think that the policy that needs to change to kind of encourage these, these changes to more of a value added system? Well, I think that the policies have to change 
to reflect what technology provides us to do. Um, years ago, we came to the conclusion that it would be less expensive for the system if we could treat people in their home if they didn't have uh, a, a need to be in the hospital. And home care centers popped up all around the country and they did everything from oxygen delivery for people with COPD to intravenous, um, um, intravenous antibiotics for people with serious infections where they didn't have a hospital stay involved in it. Like many things in life, we had a lot of good apples and we had a few bad apples and people wanted to game the health, the home health system. So government's reaction to that is we can't pick out the ones that are in it for a nefarious reason. So we're going to eliminate the space and we're going to force everybody to come back in the hospital. Didn't increase the level of care but it did increase the cost of the delivery of that care exponentially because now all of a sudden you had hospital stays. And as we've learned in the last decade, anytime you visit the hospital, there is a possibility that you will leave the hospital with an infection, which means you're going to be readmitted um, for probably something more serious. And it, it all deals with the uh, antimicrobial resistance that exists in um, in the world today. It's not just the United States. And it becomes uh, problematic when, you, when you're in a healthcare delivery system. Um, the other kind of element of all of this is, is costs. And, and I know Democrats have focused a lot on prescription drugs, but as a practical matter, in 2021, Americans spent $378 billion on prescription drugs um, and, and $1.32 trillion um, on hospital expenditures, 864 billion on, on physicians and things. How do we bring those costs down? Is it just competition? Is there something that we can do to kind of rethink the system? Well, it's one simple word, it's transparency. We require every component of healthcare to be transparent about what the cost is of that service. If you're gonna to go to a doctor's office, then at least list the top 10 things that people go to a doctor's office for and list the price it's gonna be. It shouldn't be determined whether you're insured or whether you're paying out of pocket. And it's amazing to me how you can get out of the hospital and if you call the hospital and say, I'd like to pay cash, the price goes down about 40%. It, it, it's, it's, it's sort of ridiculous. We, we have a marketplace that is in the trillions of dollars, as you just pointed out, where we have no requirement our, on our part to be a shopper. And Think about when you go to buy something on Amazon, you probably go through 15 lines and you, then you check the reviews on the product and then you're looking to see, can I get it tomorrow? And what's the cost in comparison? We compare everything in life based upon the cost to us and, and the value that we're getting, except for healthcare. It's, it's kind of crazy, especially given the prices on some of the health care. And, you know, if you, if, if, if you want an exercise, if you're in health policy as a major or um, some area of health care and you want a project, then just pick up the phone and call health care facilities and say, I need an MRI. I don't have insurance. First, ask how much it is and then tell them you don't have insurance and you'd like to pay cash. And look at the differential that you get as you call facility after facility. Now we're beginning to see competition in the country where people who have a reasonable expectation at a return on a capital investment are providing medical services like CAT scans and x-rays and they price it the same way every time because they're not in it for what insurance will or won't pay. And um, you're, when, you, when you see concierge medicine somewhere, that's in essence what they've done. They've said, for me to have you as a patient is gonna cost you $1,000 a year and I will see you 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And, and you think about it and you say, boy, that's awfully expensive. Well, that's because you don't see how much healthcare is costing you. And somehow we have to force that transparency so people take a more active role in being a consumer of healthcare 
And consumer means you understand what you're getting and you understand what it's costing. We've seen a lot of venture capital and private equity firms buying up doctors groups in, in the recent um, last few years. Do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? Depends on who it's for. <laughs> um, if you're if you venture capital company and, and you purchased practices, you purchased them because the return on what you invested is that significant. And you know, I don't I don't want to try to preach private equity and, and venture capital because 29 years ago when I went to Congress, I was in the private sector. There wasn't venture capital and private equity. So I've had to learn it in the nine months that I've been out of Congress, uh, try to figure out how does this animal work? Well, it works because they're able to go to the marketplace to people with money and say, we're returning 10% of every dollar that you invest in our fund. Well, if you can only get 5% at the bank and you can only get 8% if you invest in this mutual fund, 10% looks pretty good. You still have to weigh the risk. Now, all of a sudden, venture capital especially is not limited to a particular type of product. They're multifaceted funds. So what did we see for about a 10 year period? We saw some venture capital companies in the country actually finance a class action lawsuits. Now, why would a venture capital business get in the business of financing class action lawsuits? In other words, they were paying lawyers to be able to take a case to carry it through to litigation. Why? Because they were betting on the fact that they would win the civil litigation and they were getting the lion's share of the proceeds back to the venture capital business because in that particular case, they might've been making 20% return on investment. 20% raises their overall percentage of their fund, which means more people are gonna put money into their fund. So this is all about how do you attract capital, private capital to invest in a fund that you're in charge of investing the money in. And you're gonna to go to wherever the greatest return on investment is, unless there's a mission. And I would tell you a company like uh, Cerberus in New York $80 billion private equity business, one component of what they're doing right now is, is a fund uh, specifically designed towards national security. They're willing to buy businesses that need to be protected in this company, in, in this country, whether they make money or not. Um, and they've gone to an investor class. It's not looking for a rate of return. They're looking for the satisfaction of knowing that we've protected some things in this country that are national security issues. You mentioned people getting infections in hospitals, which brings me to the prescription drug areas. And how do we get drug companies to invest in things like new antibiotics that we need them, but we need them to be used very rarely so that they stay potent and therefore there's not much money to be made with them or, or less money to be made than there are with other drugs. How do we direct private companies to do sort of the public good, I guess? Sure. Is the way um, well, Brian, it's tough because um, their investments are gonna to go to areas that they've determined there's a marketplace for. And that's why we went through almost three decades where vaccines were not a priority for medical innovators because vaccines typically found the lowest reimbursement, in some cases, a price that was set by government, whether it's the US government, whether it's the British uh, system, whether it's the Canadian system, they all, they, they all found a way to cap it. And drug discovery is a very expensive thing. Vaccine development is incredibly expensive and takes an inordinate amount of time in comparison to say a small molecule or single molecule uh, oral medication uh, that's addressing a specific thing. And um, part of this comes from what our healthcare policy is. And in some cases, it may require a federal government incentive for the innovation in a particular space of need. In other areas, uh, we've got to look at ways that we streamline the approval process because for every dollar that an application for a product sits before it's approved. That's totally passed on to the consumer. 
So if, if I'm a healthcare innovator and I've got a drug at the FDA, this is the best rule of thumb for every day that that sits at the FDA waiting for a decision that costs that innovative company $10,000 a day. So if I can find a way to shorten the period of time, then I'm saving $10,000 a day for every day that we short it. Now, as Brian said, I, 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 I wrote the Food Drug Modernization Act in 1997, which was the first time we had changed the FDA since 1935 when it was created. And the one thing that I did was I made sure that the gold standard was still there. We didn't lower the bar, but we gave the FDA some new statutory authorities to do some things differently. One of the authorities that I gave them in 1997 was to use foreign clinical data on a drug in their application process with the FDA. Makes a lot of sense. Expand the, the amount of clinical data that you're able to capture, you're going to have a much better safety and efficacy understanding. From 1997 till 2020, when COVID hit, the FDA had never given the approval to any company to use foreign data for a U.S. application. Never. And then with the need to develop multiple vaccines in 12 months, all of a sudden, we uh, manufacturers were able to use all the data that they could find globally. Now, it, it, as we learned in COVID, um, it was unintentional, but we had a, a, a diversity issue. Not just a diversity issue on access to uh, vaccines. That was easy to geographically sort of fix. But we had a diversity issue as far as the pool of clinical data and the fact that everybody in the world was using it. So we really didn't have good data on certain geographical areas of the world because we had never captured any, um, any real clinical data on people that grew up there, people that lived there. Here's the change that you're going to see over your lifetime. AI is going to be the most disruptive technology you will see as long as you live. And you can look at it and say, well, I don't want that. Well, if, if, if you aspire to that, you never have a cell phone because cell phones basically put AT&T and landlines out of business, except for my wife still invests in having a landline. Uh, just so she can sit there and watch it ring and let the answering machine answer it. It's, it's, an, it's an amazing thing. I just can't understand it. Um, but technology can be a bad thing. Um, some in this country are obsessed with their phone. They're on it all the time. Uh, I have a seven-year-old, a five-year-old, and, th and three-year-old, and a one-year-old grandchild. I can assure you that my three-year-old can open my phone. <laughs> and my phone's on facial recognition. That tells you just how much he looks like me. <laughs> but my seven-year-old can take a phone and she can do anything with it. Not because she has one. It's because she's watched. And when she could access it, she plays with it. And uh, parents and grandparents are real good about giving their phone to a grandchild because uh, they can look at pictures, they can do all this, and it entertains them for at least 10 minutes, which is all the time you need to sort of refresh yourself. Well, in that 10 minutes, they learn all the functions of that cell phone. So the capacity to learn at the age they're at is unbelievable. And Are communities really going to say we're a no cell phone community because we're concerned what it's socially doing to our kids? They can try. But there are a generation out there that aren't going to buy that. And pretty soon they're going to be eligible to vote. And whoever made this law, they're going to vote new people in and they're going to change it. That's, that's democracy. That's the American system. Part of what I think my responsibility was when I was in Washington is I had to weigh what was the right policy and where are the people that I represent on it? How, how do I bring the right balance to both sides of it? And that's not just 
to the issue. Um, how do I bring the right balance from a standpoint of people that are on diametrically different political ends? That has to be taken into consideration too. Um, I, I've had the good fortunes to be everywhere in the world I could ever want to travel more than once in some places I never wanted to go in the first place, but I had to. And it's without exception that I get somewhere and they look at me and they say, why do you guys put up with the United States Senate? It seems to stop everything. And I look at them and say, you know, that's why we keep it because it slows everything down. It makes us think about what it is we're doing and how does it affect the people that we represent. Um, most countries in the world got rid of the second legislative body because they said they didn't want their system to slow down. They wanted it to be able to act and, and go quickly. Let me just share with you. There's no way that you can legislate as fast as change happens in society today. So if we walk out and we did some over encompassing legislation on AI, what does that do next year when we got a whole new AI platform? If we had regulated um, computer chips at one gig, where would we be now when we've got them, you know, spanning the globe? It, it, it makes no sense because statute can't organically change. And Congress is there to make a definitive line, a guardrail. And the question going forward is how do we do it in a way that it has an organic ability to change based upon how technology changes? And that's probably especially true given the Supreme Court's embrace of the major questions doctrine where Congress can't just say, you bureaucrats, you know, adapt with the times to this because uh, the Supreme Court's gonna say, no, no, Congress has to weigh in on that. Based on the, the way the Constitution's written, right. uh, the court's making the right determination. Right. And the only way that Congress can get around that is to make sure that they wrote something differently. And that's a, that's a challenging thing to get done. And I think we're, we're about to see how the House and the Senate are different vividly over the next month or two. Um, but but they, they may not take a month. <laughs> it, may, may not, it, may, it may be by the end of the week yeah. at, at this point. Um, well, we're going to get into AI in, in a second, but I want to ask you about another issue you've worked on that I know is, is pretty relevant to people in this room, which is student loan policy. Um, what do we need to do both to address the, I think it's billions in student loan debt that, that are held by young Americans, old Americans, and everyone in between, and then the drivers of that debt, the costs of college and higher ed in general? Um, in full disclosure, I was not in favor of any of the forgiveness programs. So if, if you were form, then um, I had no ability to impact it. I was like you, I had an opinion. Um, but in January, that opinion stopped from a standpoint of what I could do. Um, I had initiated, uh, along with my colleague from Maine, Angus King, for the last five years, changes to the student loan uh, repayment system, as simple as you would only be responsible to pay 10% of your income, your net income, over whatever period of time and after 20 or 25 years, I can't remember, if you still had a balance, it would go away. Everybody had a responsibility to repay, but we understood that there were some institutions, some private, some public, uh, that stuck people with big bills. And so we didn't want people to have to stretch over and above what they could, could potentially do and 10% of their net income seemed like a comfortable place. I think it's safe to say that education should be like healthcare also. There's a cost and you gotta assess what you're getting for it. Now, I'll tell you an interesting situation that happened to me one day. I was meeting with the chancellor of a North Carolina institution and um, I was sort of on my high horse that day. 
And I looked at him and said, you know, you guys at the institution level, you have to change your curriculum, your majors, to reflect something that has a 21st century job. Why would you offer a major that didn't have a job on the other side? And he looked at me and he said, like what? And I, if there are any poetry majors, I'll apologize to you up front. <laughs> I said, how about poetry majors? Where's the job on the other side? And he looked at me and he said, Senator, my daughter's a poetry major. <laughs> I said, I bet she's unemployed, isn't she? So I was just trying to make a point that um, the world's spinning so fast, shouldn't we put, be putting as much lead on the target as we possibly can? Shouldn't we be trying to funnel people into the talents where the job market is plentiful and uh, where everybody who graduates has an opportunity to compete for that job? Sorry, that's when my phone goes off and I hear it in my hearing aids. <laughs> um, so, Part of it's a responsibility of the institutions to um, rethink what it is they offer, how they offer it. I, I might say this attracts a little bit of interest from faculty. <laughs> um, and on the part of the students, U of Penn's a great school. Be really glad that you made the decision to come here. Now, on the other side, tongue in cheek, I meet with a lot of CEOs. Um, it used to be when I went to school where you went meant a lot. There are two things that people look at in the hiring process today. What's your major? Is it what I need? And two, do you fit? It's the personality. It's the reason some of the schools have gotten away from scores and they do personal interviews about who gets in because they're looking for how the team fits together. And I would tell you, practically all business, and this was the effect of the, of the tech industry, the tech industry, if you didn't fit, and they flexed it as much as they could, pool tables and ping pong and free food and, and everything, but if you didn't fit, then there was a problem. So um, we've got to look at both ends of it, where students are choosing majors that are responsive to what the marketplace looks like and institutions are responsible to then provide that type of major. And in the absence of one or the other, then we have a real challenge as to what we do in this country. If, if, if you wanna assure yourself of a job today, then major in something like cybersecurity and you will have a job for a lifetime. Uh, computer science, goes without saying engineering, but it's, it's got to have a tech component that goes along with it because that's what the tech world needs and um, that's where the opportunities are going to grow. A lot of my friends are computer science engineers, so I can tell you that is absolutely right. Um, I want to ask you a question that actually got spurred by a news story today that one of your former Republican colleagues is proposing legislation to cap uh, credit card interest rates at 18%. Oh, Josh Hawley, yes. I read that too. And I, I'm curious, is this still the same Republican party that you joined years ago and that you served as a proud member of for, for decades in Congress? It, it's not a Congress that reflects what I joined 28 years, 29 years ago. Um, you know, I used to go home when I was a new member of Congress and. When I went home and people say, what did you do this week? And I said, nothing. And I was sort of embarrassed and they'd applaud because they really didn't want us to do anything. And now when we desperately need things done, Congress does nothing. Um, it's, it's sort of strange and, and Americans are critical of Congress for, for not being able to get things done. Let me, let me explain to you something about the United States Senate. Now, I had 28 years in Washington, 10 years in the House, 18 in the Senate. Uh, I'd say that the 10 years in the House was understanding how the Senate works <laughs> and saying, God, I'd never be one of them. Um, and I voluntarily left the House with no intentions of running for the Senate. And when I realized the investment that people had made in me, specifically in healthcare, um, to pay them back, I owed it to them to actually go to the Senate for some period of time. Um, if 
at U of Penn, every class you attended. At the beginning of class, the professor had to stand up and say, okay, here's our lesson for today. How many people are okay with that? And how many people object to us moving forward? And if 60% of the room didn't vote to move forward, then the professor said, okay, we're not gonna meet today, go home. <laughs> that describes the United States Senate. If 60% of the United States Senate, 60 members, don't agree to do something, then it's not done, period, end of sentence. So if you're a serious legislator, which at times I tried to be, and you wanted to get legislation passed in Congress and signed by a president, in the United States Senate, I woke up every day and, and when I had a good thought on legislation and we put it together, I immediately went to a Democrat that I thought would be passionate about the same issue and I said, hey, would you partner with me? Now, I took a lot of heat at home. Who were the original partners that I went to? Ted Kennedy. Ted Kennedy knew healthcare. You know, it's, it's said in Washington, if you really want to catch a senator off guard, ask him, ask him a question when their staff's not there. <laughs> and I can tell you with Ted Kennedy, you could ask him anything on health care and Ted Kennedy could answer it without his staff. And that's, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for somebody that's going to cover your back when they start actually shooting with real bullets in the United States Senate. And you got Democrats and Republicans opposed to what I'm trying to do. And you might have a Democrat leader opposed to it. Is John Dingell still going to be here with me? He was always there. The other one, Barbara Mikulski from Maryland. She was the most tenacious woman that was three foot four inches high. <laughs> and she wrote under a pseudonym name, the nastiest trash books I have ever, I'd never read them, but she showed them to me. And um, you just wouldn't think of it, but when she got her teeth into somebody, she would not let go. And she was the chairman of the Appropriations Committee, so no Democrat wanted to challenge her. She was the perfect partner. And she and I did things on child, uh, child care that um, had never even been thought could be accomplished. And we transformed the entire uh, child care category, uh, just two of us. So in the United States Senate, you woke up and you found the partner. Now that didn't assure you that you were gonna be successful, but it gave you a, a hell of an edge and it gave the perception to everybody, they may not do it this year, but they'll probably accomplish it next year or the year after. So we might as well give in and just accept what they're doing. Somebody asked me lobbying Congress on the way in, I'm looking for him, I can't see him. And part of, part of being successful at doing it is making sure they know you're not going away. And I would tell you that that's the same thing that's true on applying for a job. I mean, you can go through the cursory motions and say, yeah, I'd like to come interview. I remember somebody was trying to get a job with what was then Piedmont Airlines, it's now American. And there was a, there was a glut of pilots, but he was young and he wanted a job. And he sent his resume on the top of a cake to the people at Piedmont Airlines because he was convinced that nobody read his resume. So he had the resume on the top of the cake and he had it delivered to the personnel department at Piedmont Airlines and he got hired. So when you think about employment, there, there's this way you can do it and you can say, well, they either hire me or they don't. Or you can turn on every spigot that you can find. If you really want the job, do everything you possibly can to get hired. I'll give you one piece of advice. Decide where you want to live and then decide what you want to do. You can have the greatest job in the world, but if you hate where you live, you will only be a temporary employee. At some point in your life, you're going to eventually go to where you want to live versus to suffer through where you are and, and what you're doing. A, a perfect job in the wrong place will be a bad job long term. I, I will assure you of that. So, uh, it, in a lot of cases today, you're already making that decision based upon where you go to school. Uh, but uh, there are some that hold out from that and they've got to go to Washington, they've got to go to New York, they've got to do this, they've got to do that. Decide where you want to live. There's a community there that's going to be just as much fun as anywhere else you go. 
I want to switch to national security. Um, what's the biggest threat facing the United States today? Well, the short answer is the biggest threat is the one we don't know about. I mean, um, that's what used to keep me up at night, and it still does to some degree. I was with uh, the Prime Minister of Israel one day, Menachem Begin. I think that I think it was Menachem. We were having lunch in the capital, and I turned to him and said, "What do you think the greatest fear in the world is today?" And his answer was the disregard for human life. And he went on to define it. He said, if somebody's willing to sit beside you at a bus stop and blow themselves up and kill you, how do you, how do you defend that? So um, as we go forward, countries that don't respect life the way we do, and I'm not getting into an abortion thing here, life whether people live or don't. Um, that's what concerns me because everybody will have the technological tools to do nefarious bad things. And some of it we can stop and some of it, quite frankly, we will not be able to stop because they're willing to take their own lives to do it. Um, I spent a tremendous amount of time in Afghanistan and Iraq over the last uh, 20 years. And um, greatest army in the world, greatest military in the world, greatest technology in the world. And we still couldn't stop a guy walking down the street that had a suicide vest on that wanted to kill a group of American soldiers or a group of Americans. And um, that is such a rudimentary thing, a suicide vest, but it is almost an impossible thing to eliminate. Um, what do you think that as you've talked a lot about technology and how important it is, do you think that we are ready for the threats to our digital infrastructure or things that are kind of you know, online, whether it's the electric grid or, or other things, or do we need to really put a lot more energy into cybersecurity kind of things? Hopefully I answered that when I said, if, if you've got a cybersecurity major, you got a job for life. Um, this is this is going to be an issue. Uh, it, it is today. It will be tomorrow. And part of it comes from the fact that um, connectivity globally requires us to have cables and to use satellites for communication. Um, if you can intercept a, a satellite signal and encrypt and and break the encryption on it then you can get the data that's on it if you can tap an undersea cable and pull stuff off either encrypted or non-encrypted then it's a valuable tool to you economically militarily um and and we're that's the world we're in we ha we have two modes of of communicating if if you talk about inside Washington from the White House to the Defense Department um, and the branches of government, they operate off of a closed backbone. So there's the, the, to penetrate that, you actually have to penetrate the backbone itself. And it's pretty easy to secure and defend the backbone. But that's not the case when you're transmitting outside of those federal agencies. So, um, it's the reason we're, <laughs> if in government today we could say to government employees, okay, you cannot bring your cell phone into the workplace. Because as, as soon as you get on our Wi-Fi in the system and you click on that message from your uncle and you find out it's not your uncle, we're screwed. It happens every day. Um, defensive thing, eliminate cell phones. Eliminate cell phones, everybody quits because the cell phone has become such a functional part of your daily life, whether that's to check on your kids, whether it's to uh, uh, shop on Amazon when you're on break, whatever it is, you've got to have that piece. So there's some things that we could do that make us safer, but we can't do 
uh, because of the public's demand to have access. I was at a, uh, a restaurant the other day that had a sign, no, we don't have Wi-Fi. Pretend it's 1995 and talk to one another. <laughs> well, I will say this. I, I mean, I made the observation probably 10 years ago. Um, I was walking on the street in New York, and uh, everybody walking down the street had ear pods or headphones or something on, and nobody talked to each other. It's no, uh, it's not surprising to me that we have a almost a social retardation um, um, that exists in society because we're really we're really not responsive to conversation. And listen, a husband and wife. They can be accused of that. It happens, um, but it but it shouldn't with people outside, and that's why I said if if you really want to focus on how to get hired or how to get accepted into school, then pass the test where they bring you in and they interview you in person, and you got to look them in the eye, and you got to carry on a conversation with them. It's not about they're not asking you about how smart you are. They want to see how you can converse with a stranger. How engaging are you? How comfortable are you doing it? And um, that applies to everything now. Yeah. Uh, you, you were involved in pandemic policy long before anyone in America thought about it to anywhere near the degree that we do today. And I'm wondering with the benefit of a little bit of hindsight, how would you kind of grade our response to COVID? What did we do right? What did we do wrong? Um, if you only get one chance to grade, then we got 100. Uh, because we did something the world didn't think was possible. We got a vaccine in 12 months. And for many Americans, that vaccine saved their lives. Um, now we're at a different phase. And um, like viral infections historically, this bug has changed and as it changed it became less virulent meaning it killed less people and in some cases it became more transmissible meaning it infected more people and de depending on some aspect whether it's one's dna can make up or some aspect of their life some are affected more severely than others We're going to learn in the next 45 days um, how the American people look at what I refer to now as our annual COVID shot, just like our annual flu shot. I don't think you're going to see these multiples a, a year. You're going to see one time a year, and it's going to be time based upon where we see the surge of infection happening. And the option is going to be there for you, and it's probably going to be free um, to have your COVID shot. Now. I'm over 65. Um, I don't do a good job like this guy of wearing a mask. Um, I probably take the shot, but it's a personal decision. If you look at the projections on the uptake of the booster that's coming out probably next week, uh, we expect 22% of the American people to take the booster. 22 means 78% of the people said, uh, uh not, not me, not anymore. Uh, yet to our knowledge, nobody died of the vaccine. So it passed really well on safety and efficacy. There are some questions about, um, uh, myocarditis in, uh, younger males. It's not in females. And that's something that we got to study. The one, you know, if there was a compelling reason I would tell you to take the shot is that the shot clearly has an impact on long COVID. And if you know somebody that's got long COVID, it is unbelievably terrifying. And we don't know why it goes away. Uh, we don't know what causes it. And um, the best way to make sure that you don't get long COVID, which you can get with a mild case of, of COVID, you can get long COVID, um, is to take the shot. What do we need to do differently for the next pandemic, if anything? 
Well, we, we've, we've sort of done our after action review and uh, I'll just sort of wave top what we changed. So I wrote, the, I wrote the legislation in 2006 and I created a new Assistant Secretary of Emergency Preparedness at HHS and that person was supposed to be statutorily in charge of any response, whether it was H1N1 flu, whether it was H5N1, whether it was Ebola, whether it was Mars, SARS, or, or now COVID. Um, through four different administrations, one, two, three, four different administrations, nobody ever used the emergency secretary of emergency preparedness as the statutory head. They all picked somebody else and they became the, the, the guru of that disease. So um, the one thing that we recognized early on in COVID was that when the vice president went out every afternoon for 15 minutes and gave America an update on COVID, all the networks tuned in and a lot of people in the country turned in because the vice president went out and said, here's what we accomplished today. Here's what we're going to try to accomplish tomorrow. And I'll get back with you tomorrow night and tell you how we did. When then uh, President Trump hijacked the press conference from the vice president and turned it into an hour and a half um, dog and pony show, one 24 hour news stopped covering it. American people turned it out, tuned it out for, for all practical reasons. Um, this is something we identified in 2006 when we put the legislation together, that communications was the single most important thing to a health threat in this country. We responded unbelievably in certain ways. We had no testing capacity for COVID. And the CDC, federal agency, supposed to be prepared, totally, totally dropped the ball. They weren't capable of doing it. And the head of NIH went out and we gave him enough money and he basically challenged the technology companies in the country to come up with COVID testing in 90 days. And we had 400 plus COVID tests available. We made a mistake. Uh, we said, go to market. And then you might remember about three months after we turned these guys loose on the marketplace, we had the cases come down. So nobody was at Walgreens or CVS buying their COVID test. And 90% of them went out of business in the next six months. We should have identified the fact that when we create a new technology like that for national security reason, that we've got to partner them with a company that has the staying power to be able to keep them in the business, has the logistics capability to distribute it, not just nationally, but globally. And for a lot of these tech firms, they weren't capable of doing that. So um, hopefully the next time this comes around, we will have learned our reaction time is going to be better and we've got to hit um, a $5 price point for an at-home test. Part of the, the, I guess, consequence of COVID um, was the kind of politicization and the, the loss of faith um, from Americans on, I think, both ideological sides uh, in the public health agencies. How do we restore that? How do we try to, to get back to, to where we were at one point where people trusted what they heard from those healthcare authorities? I, listen, you're going to think I'm a broken record because it's going to be the same answer I gave you on healthcare. It's transparency. It's actually sharing with the American people the data that they draw their guidance from. Um, at a minimum, the CDC should take the data that they accumulated and share it with UPenn and share it with John Hopkins and share it with these major academic institutions so that faculty members who are esteemed in the field can either confirm their guidance based upon the data or can say, hey, you didn't look at this right. But the CDC and government agencies are scared of, of being questioned. And um, you've, you've, you've got to open up the system. It's got to have sunlight or it's never going to be disinfected to the degree that we've got to for the average American to hear it and to act upon it. Um, I think if Tony Fauci were here and Tony and I are good friends and I've defended him in a, uh, probably more than I, than I should, but Tony's singing a whole different tune this year 
than he did when he was in the administration um, because he realizes once he got on the outside looking in, he realized the reaction that the American people were having to these suggestive mandates. And um, he's one that's out calling for transparency now and really challenging the CDC to bring out to America uh, the raw data so that people can make their own determinations. It, you, you, can't, you can't mandate somebody to take something. That's, that's a reality. And um, my fear is that if they don't change this year, that we will have parents that say, well, if you can't mandate that I take this, then how can you mandate that my children before they go to kindergarten have to take these three shots that cover six different diseases? Big difference between uh, reigniting measles and diphtheria and all the things that we as society have said, those are good things to have eliminated. We don't have to, to risk. And, and I would tell you that the next big um, decision we're gonna have to make is on um, RSV. Um, RSV in young kids and RSV in seniors over 65, two different categories. And the RSV in young kids has no treatment. Um, so it's a, if we can get a vaccine, uh, then that may be uh, on the block to talk about whether that's a mandatory thing. Um, we're gonna start, we'll bring some audience questions in about five minutes if you have them. Um, get those on those cards, then we'll start working them in. Curious, domestic terrorism has become a uh, hot topic in, in a lot of ways. How are we doing in, in combating that? We're doing well. Um, you know, every, everybody's definition of domestic terrorism is slightly different. Um, some people will call a domestic terrorist uh, somebody who is actually a, a pretty avid a, 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 um, um, <coughs> word I'm looking for um, activist. Yeah, and um, others wouldn't class an activist that way. I think the challenging thing, and in the the area of responsibility for the federal government, for Congress, and for our federal law enforcement and local law enforcement, is what are the tools we're gonna to provide to those entities to make sure that they can see into domestic terrorism and do they have the tools that they need to suppress the impact of domestic terrorism? Um, most people, well, it seems like China and the United States, certainly that the relationship has frayed some in the last few years. What do we need to do? What, what should our policy be toward China moving forward in the next five, 10 years? Listen, I, I said in an earlier session, um, people think this is all about economic competition. The Chinese cannot compete with the United States. They cannot compete with the, the innovation that comes out of this country. Uh, if they get even close, then we just turn it on a little bit more. But they've been extremely good at stealing technology. And that stealing technology has allowed them to match that with 3 billion people that's a consumer market, 3 billion people, and then to artificially allow those 3 billion consumers to actually purchase um, the products that they make. And through that consumer activity, they're able to then take the technology and grow a military that is second uh, second biggest, most impactful military in the world. Um, I really don't worry today about a war with China because China knows they would lose. But it would be devastating to the globe. So we should do everything we can to make sure that that's never even a possibility. But when... I, I'll take you back probably 20 years ago um, I was lobbying our good friends in Europe to take a stand on genocide in Rwanda. Why Rwanda? Because it was so blatantly genocide 
and it was on the evening news and people were dying and um, no society in the world can sit by and, and watch something like that happen. And I got absolutely no response out of the Europeans. What I learned was that genocide on their continent, the European continent, they take very seriously. Genocide anywhere else in the world, that was somebody else's problem as they looked at it. So even though they owned Africa from a standpoint of their agricultural community, they were the market for the limited amount of agriculture that came, they didn't want to own it from a standpoint of um, challenging them on genocide in a given country. I don't want anybody to forget that China is probably one of the worst human rights abusers in the world. There may be some that are smaller, that, that are bigger per capita, but when you look at China from a standpoint of, of human rights, there are significant populations that are treated as slaves and um, it's all to fuel the economic engine and the military engine of the Chinese. If it were any other country, United States and the Europeans would not stand for it to happen. We would stop trade with them. We would do a lot of different things to try to alter their human rights abuse. Um, China has now gotten to the size where the disruption would be so large, not even the United States can go that far in policy or sanctions. Uh, I will tell you this will probably be re-explored at some point once the world changes the supply chain. And I think the most drastic thing that we learned from COVID is that the supply chain can no longer be reliant on the percentage of things that we got from China. And to accomplish that, we can't do it alone as the United States. We have to have partners around the world, all of Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, um, South Korea, Japan, and we're in the process of creating a new supply chain design. And if China and Russia want to be buddies with North Korea and they want to create their own supply chain between the three of them, so be it. But the rest of the world is not going to be held hostage to what comes out of China, whether it's military, I mean, whether it's medical equipment that we need for response to a, a pandemic. Um, or any other aspect of what the consumer market needs. Probably right at the top of the list is active pharmaceutical ingredients or API, which is used to make every drug uh, in the world and 70% of it comes out of China. We've got to find technological ways to create API where we're not relying on China as a supplier. And we're quite frankly, we're not relying on India to wake up one day and say, we're not going to export any more API because we need it for ourselves. Um, that's not the way you have stabilization in a marketplace. So it could be things like synthetic biology um, that allow us to create our own API, but we're not technologically there yet. So we've got a bunch of audience okay. questions here from all over the place. Um, but uh, there are a couple on China, so we'll stick where, where we are. First is what is China's assertiveness, what, what is going on with the China and the United States going to do to the American role in the Pacific? And it mentioned a trade deal. I think the, the Australian, uh, I don't know the acronym, but the Australian, British, yeah. American trade deal. So we've got a, we've got a relationship with Australia and New Zealand that goes back um, to post-World War II. Uh, they're considered a Five Eyes partner where we share uh, with them like we do the Brits uh, and the Canadians. Um, they are a key component to this, to the Asian strategy, Southeast Asian strategy. Um, if you look for the last five years, China's been going around the South China Sea and uh, through their checkbook, they've been getting countries, islands to um, buy into their economic uh, pathway forward called um, Belt and Roads. And um, basically bankrupting these islands because they go in and steal their, their natural resources. Uh, they go in and build an infrastructure and pay for the infrastructure, um, but they don't tell them at the beginning that they sh they're gonna ship in the Chinese labor. Problem is Chinese labor shipped to that island and they never leave. 
because China's trying to export them somewhere else in the world. Um, we have in the last 18, 18 months with our partners in the region gone in and reversed a majority of the islands now uh, over to being aligned with not just us from a um, economic and defense standpoint, but from a supply chain standpoint. Uh, that's a major move and it's going to be extremely beneficial uh, to Australia. And I would say uh, extremely beneficial to the islands in the South Pacific because Australia is a very rich country from a standpoint of its own um, resources. Bunch of partisan um, political kinds of questions. One that maybe is most interesting uh, for you would be, how can Republican politicians combat uh, the, the sense, the, the feeling among the, the GOP base and persuade them that engaging with the world, whether that be Ukraine, Israel, is worthwhile and necessary? Um, sort of how to combat the, the isolationist impulse that we're seeing even in, in some of the folks in the House saying we shouldn't be funding Ukraine anymore. How do, how do we convince the Republican base that global engagement is a good thing? Um, leadership. Um, a lot of things in life always fall back to leadership. Um, but we've gone through these phases before. Um, it, it's probably never lasted as long as it has right now. But that's because the political system in America is so divisive right now. And social media is such a tool, both good and bad, uh, factual and non-factual. Um, and there are all sorts of individuals that have no dog in this fight, uh, China, Russia, who are doing everything they can to feed the system to cause division in this country. Uh, when I went in and investigated the 2016 elections, three years, to see where there was outside interference, um, the Russians played us like a fiddle. Um, when you remember the, the incident in Charlottesville, Virginia, where you had white supremacists and, and um, um, some activist element that met and there was one person killed. And um, if you could peel the onion back, what we found was Russia drove the entire thing. They drove both sides of it. They put fictitious information out to two groups announcing that there was going to be a rally in Charlottesville Saturday at the same time in the same place. So the two groups didn't organically show up there. They were motivated by Russia bots and, and the IRA, which was part of Prigozhin's uh, internet service uh, that drove these two competing entities into a situation on a Saturday in Charlottesville where they both showed up and conflict erupted. <clears throat> Um, I, my first reaction was I'm surprised more people didn't get killed uh, based upon what happened. But, um, you know, in America, we can't shy away from uh, these types of interactions. But what we have to do is we have to be much greater stewards of how technology is truthful. And that's going to be very challenging as it relates to AI. You, since you brought up um, social media, it, the question is a lot of evidence that social media like TikTok is causing a decline in institutional trust in government. How can the government regain this trust? You know, trust is something you earn. Um, there has to be an effort put to it and there's not much of an effort that's coming out of government today. Uh, if we see, as it relates to COVID, like CDC, take a different stand, transparent, open, sharing information, that begins to rebuild it. Um, a lot of this falls on members of Congress. Uh, every event can't be a political event. At some point, this has to be about the future of, of the country. And um, I made this statement this morning. I, of 29 years that I've been associated with Washington, I've never seen a lower level of curiosity to learn. And that's at the staff or member level. Um, 
yet we're headed into a period of the most difficult policy issues to understand, very technologically or healthcare driven, which require a tremendous amount of education on the part of policymakers, yet no real capacity to, no, no interest or curiosity to learn. I'm, I'm not sure how you close that gap. So this is gonna be sort of a fascinating time. Yeah, and especially you start talking about the technological stuff, some of the healthcare stuff. If you don't know the substance, it's pretty impossible to-, to it's, it's impossible to get the right answer. Right. <laughs> So this, this is an interesting question. As one of the GOP senators who voted to convict former President Trump, what can you say to young Americans who are sympathetic to Republicans' economic vision but cannot support in good conscience a party that refu largely refuses to distance itself from Trump? Um, that each one of us as an individual has the right to choose whoever we support or don't support. Um, but let me be perfectly clear as to why I voted to impeach the president because the house manager came up to me afterwards and he said, I just want to thank you for your vote. And I said, Jamie, don't thank me. You didn't make your case. Um, I didn't impeach the president based upon any of the charges that the house brought up. I impeached the president because I was there. He left the vice president uncovered in the United States Capitol with a nuclear football. I was beside Tommy Tuberville when he talked to, um, Mayor Giuliani and the president on the phone. And Tuberville at the time said, you don't understand. The vice president is exposed. You need to send everything you can to secure the vice president. And the response from the two in the White House was, no, we want you to focus on delaying the vote. That's why I voted to impeach the president, because that was a breach of his oath of office. Um, and quite frankly, didn't change because the vice president was there with us until they hustled him out. Um, so I actually knew what happened. It doesn't, it doesn't take a big investigation to, to figure it out. All you have to do is talk to people that were there. And um, the difficulty is that doesn't disqualify somebody from ever running again but everybody has to use their own conscience to go through the process. Um, and I'll, I'll make this statement. Uh, I can't believe what the likely choices that we have this year are going to be. Uh, I mean, to, to me, it is really difficult to believe that this is satisfactory to the American people. And I think to some degree, um, it tells you that it gets darker before it gets light. Maybe the most amazing fact about the choices we face is that Al Gore is younger than both of them and, and he hasn't run for president in <laughs> quarter century. Um, Never thought about it in that term. I, I saw that and it just sort of gobsmacked me, yeah. you know, I hadn't been on the ballot in decades. But um, uh, back to a policy question. What are your thoughts on investing more in community college and trade school versus higher education? Absolutely essential that we do it, but more important is that we need to make sure that we convey to parents that not every child was meant to go to college. Um, we went through several decades where we insisted that every child had to go to college if they wanted to be successful. The average kid coming out of a technical school today in their first three years will make more than somebody coming out of a four-year institution with a degree. Now, over the life of their uh, work um, life, the one with a four-year degree will make more money. But um, the reset that we've seen on, on technical and skilled jobs uh, provides um, everybody who pursues that course an income that they never dreamed that they could get. And uh, some of that comes out of the public community college system. Some of it comes out of the for-profit uh, system where they're specifically focused on a, a, a trade. I'll give you one example. Um, I've got a, a private college called Montreat, uh, Montreat College. They may have switched to university. It was ready to go out of business. And we have 78 institutions of higher education in North Carolina, so we got a lot. Um, and the new president came in and he made a determination that the entire school was gonna to go to one major. 
cybersecurity. So if you're going to Montreat, you only have one choice at major, <laughs> cybersecurity. Um, they're now flourishing. They're flush with cash. They have partnerships with the NSA, with every three-letter agency. And every kid that comes out of there is recruited prior to their senior year by either a private sector or, or, or public entity uh, to go to work. It's the same type of recruitment we see at the community college level and the, and the skills-based level. Uh, when you come out of a, a technical school with an automotive degree today, the likelihood is before you ever get to graduation, there's a car dealer that's going to pay you a lot of money to sign a contract to come to work for them. How can we balance um, concerns about privacy with the potential benefits of telehealth? Well, data security is in the hands of the person that collects it. And this is going to be a challenging thing as we go forward, especially as it relates to uh, the use of AI and, and the way institutions look at the data pool that they have identified and de-identified and decide whether they're going to monetize that healthcare data. Um, we still don't know the question, the answer of who, own, who owns the data. And I used in an earlier thing I've used for you guys. Um, you can't just stand up and say, this time I own the data. Uh, I've been through the exercise when we, when, as a member of Congress, we went to Google and said, no, you don't understand. You can't sell data that you collect off of Google Maps. They said, okay, put it in statute and we won't sell that data anymore. But Google Maps is now going to cost $9.95 a month. And the public went, oh my God, you can't take away Google Maps. You can't make me pay for this. You don't understand. That's part of my everyday life. So we responded to public opinion. We kept Google Maps as an entity. For most of you in the room, you could care less whether they use the data that you collect. There are some people in the world that say, well, that's my data. No, it's not your data. You, you chose to use this platform for free. And you've got to expect that every piece of data that is generated on you from this point forward is going to be, going to be monetized. Whether they get it off of Google Maps, and I will assure you that those of you who are on TikTok are losing more data to the Chinese than anything the United States will ever grab on data from you. Period, end of sentence. There's nothing that comes close. But have you ever stopped to think about this? That if you've got a car that's within the last four or five years and you're riding around and you're talking, you know, it's not just when you say, call this number, and the car pulls up that number and they call them for you. It's like Alexa, they're listening to you all the time. <laughs> um, and I will tell you one of the largest sellers of data are the automobile companies. And you might think, well, they don't, they don't hear everything that's said. They sure know when you got a flat. <laughs> they know when you've had a wreck. They know when your car needs to be serviced and they know whether you reset it. So there's a lot of stuff that's, that's picked up today. Um, most appliances today talk to their manufacturer. Now, whether that can display to them how many pounds of food you eat a, a week, I don't know. Um, but if you're going to get one fixed today, it's an amazing thing. They'll say, would you hold your phone up and would you hit these numbers on your refrigerator? And all of a sudden you hear the refrigerator go, beep, 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 beep. And the guy will tell you what's wrong with your refrigerator. <laughs> uh, so we're there. And to believe that we're going to, we're, we're going to secure everybody's data is a myth, but we at least have to consider whether it's appropriate for the federal, federal government to set guidelines or guardrails. This question said, March in 2017, watch a, remember watching you and Senator Warner have a Senate Intelligence Committee hearing on Russian interference and how marked that contrast was to the way that Adam Schiff and Devin Nunes 
<laughs> handled the same issues. And the, the person's wondering why you decided to, to do this in such a bipartisan way um, when, when the House did the opposite. And I, I guess I would broaden it to say, you know, what, why is it so important that the Intelligence Committee function the way that you and Senator Warner ran it? Um, there's a historical component to it. And then when I was chairman, uh, I announced to the committee that I wasn't going to move any legislation through that wasn't unanimous. So if there was somebody that disagreed, then we were going to sit in the room until we worked through it. I think that's a reasonable thing. And uh, it's not dissimilar to how a jury works. Uh, a jury has to be unanimous. And um, somebody who might be a holdout should at least extend to the other 14 members the opportunity to be educated because clearly they weren't if they were opposed to it. So asked, uh, what's your opinion on the, the role of lobbyists in the policymaking system? Should it be regulated? Um, would it help uh, Congress work better if the, the people were more um, uh, represented as opposed to, say, donors? Um, listen, I think we use the term lobbyist because the media defines lobbyist as somebody paid to go to Capitol Hill and do something. When you as an individual go to Capitol Hill, what do you do? You go to lobby. You go to lobby for something personally for yourself. You go to lobby for education. You go to lobby for the school, whatever it is. Um, and if you were to tweak it for the paid piece, you've now tweaked it for your piece. And the likelihood is the way the courts interpret um, third party stuff now, it would get knocked out on the Supreme Court. And they would say there can't be this 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 differential you can't limit over here. They've already made a decision, a ruling as it related to campaign financing. So I think that would extend easily uh, to lobbying. Here's the deal. Most members of Congress, if they're smart, they listen to both sides of an issue. So if they're being lobbied by a company and they're being lobbied by a, 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 a group representing um, a different view, they're bringing both of them in. So at least they're educated to make the decision as to what they do. I think some people sometimes forget that, especially given the churn at the staff level in Congress, that sometimes those lobbyists know the policy issues better than just about anybody. Oh, sure. Most of them used to be House and Senate staffers. <laughs> <laughs> um, when talking about health care reform, how much do legislators discuss systems in other countries? And then this one specifically mentions Germany, where 90% of the population is insured um, and whatnot. Um, the, the short answer is not enough. Long answer is some of us uh, are uh, spend a tremendous amount of time looking at specifically Switzerland, Germany, the UK, and Canada, uh, because all of them have different aspects to them. Um, for all the criticism we have for the US system, we err on the side of subsidizing certain aspects of healthcare because we benefit at being the first to utilize it. Um, the other challenging thing is not everybody has the infrastructure that we do in healthcare. And infrastructure is a very expensive component. I, I never will forget, I was in Berlin on a trip one year and one of the staffers on the trip actually ended up in the hospital with a kidney stone. And everybody who was on the trip's wives realized that there were no nurses in the hospital at night. So our wives took two hour shifts to go to the German hospital and sit with the staffer to make sure that there was somebody there all night long. Um, could they have done anything? No, I, I don't think, but they didn't want to leave that person there without somebody there to take care of them. There, other countries accept different values for expectations in healthcare. Ours, quite frankly, you watch every ad on TV, we got a pill that'll solve everything. And now, thank God, we got a pill that makes you lose weight <laughs> uh, and cures your diabetes at the same time. So, and, and if you believe some of the most recent data, makes you less likely of having a cardiac um, 
uh, incident. And I think there's a new third one that's a comp oh, um, delays the onset of dementia. So, you know, if, if those two things actually prove true, we know that it we know that it controls type two diabetes. We know that it has a tremendous component, uh, weight loss component. If you're able to reduce cardiac incidence and the onset of dementia with this one pill. Uh, this is the magic pill that everybody looked for. It may not let you live longer. It, well, it will let you live longer. It may not be longer than you were going to live if you led a healthy life. But uh. <laughs> um, uh, question here on when I asked before about venture capital buying into medical practices and things, and the person's curious: uh, Would American healthcare benefit if the owners of, of medical practices were just doctors instead of? business people and venture capital and, uh, and other things. You know, I, did I leave my backpack over in that other room? Huh? Would you check? <laughs> I think I did. Oh, oh it's here? Did, did I put it up here? Okay. okay. I'm just, it just, it shows my age when all of a sudden I realize something's <laughs> missing here. Uh, repeat your question, if you will. Um, Person was curious whether we would American healthcare benefit if if doctors were the ones owning doctors' practices, not businesses, venture capital, those kinds of things. Listen, I I think if you asked a doctor, would they like to own their practice versus private equity? They would say absolutely. The ones that have sold to private equity are the ones that um, are ex exhausted with the federal requirements. Uh, everything from quality reports that they have to turn in, um, reimbursements that don't reflect their cost. Um, and, and they finally just said, that's it. I, I don't want to own my practice anymore. It's too, it's too expensive. And they would rather take a, an annual salary. Even after the horrible effects of, of COVID, why hasn't there been more thought um, for, for policies that would prevent future pandemics? And, and what can Congress do? I could I, I could only assure you that I did everything possible before I left. Some of that has not yet um, been acted on, um, but it's in statute. Um, I told you about the Assistant Secretary of Emergency Preparedness, and nobody used her. That as I left in December, I created the new office, uh, White House Office of Pandemic Preparedness and Response so that that individual sits inside the White House. It's, it's actually a retired General Friedrich, um, who's a very qualified person to do it. And when he speaks going into the, the next phase of this, he speaks with the authority of the president because he's in the White House. And you couldn't convey the same thing to the American people for somebody that worked for a secretary of HHS, who's probably hadn't been in Washington three times since he <laughs> got into office, but we, we won't go there. How do we regulate the military um, and spyware like Pegasus, uh, which can infiltrate any technology? I'll answer it this way. Never forget that we're the best in the world at this. And there's no risk that we're going to take relative to a tool that can in any way, shape or form uh, alter our confidence at knowing that both in the public and private sector, that technology is secure. And we're going to have instances, we've, we've, we have them every day, uh, where somebody gets hacked, um, there's a ransom uh, process that they go through. Um, we try to learn from each one of them that happens. And we will never have a defensive mechanism that is 100%, but we get better every day. And we can anticipate what they're going to do because we're better than them. It's just we don't do the same thing. And the only time that I can think of that we have actually exercised something like that was as we got ready for the 2018 elections, when we realized what happened to us in 2016 and what the Russian uh, IRA um, uh, organization did in social media to us and six weeks before the 2018 elections we took down their entire system 
we made sure that their computers and their network were disabled to where they couldn't recover prior to the election. Now, that's not our MO. We don't usually do it. Um, and we would never do it where it adversely affected a population. But in this particular case, it set the Russians back to where they weren't even prepared to do it in 2022. And you might know that Prigozhin, who um, this was an element, element of his mercenary army, is the same guy that uh, for a couple of days uh, marched on Moscow to eliminate uh, Putin and then came to a truce and moved to Belarus. And then for some reason, um, he was in an airplane leaving Moscow and it crashed. Uh, he's the only one of uh, Putin's um, adversaries that didn't fall off a high rise building. Uh, so I give him credit that they found a different way to do it. <laughs> the net result was the same thing. <laughs> we are actually out of time. I wanna thank you so much. I know this conversation was really interesting to me and I hope it was to everyone both uh, watching on the live stream or here in person. I do wanna let everyone in the audience know that our next RBX event, uh, the cable news and talk radio host, Michael Smirkanish will be here on October the 2nd. That's Monday, October 2nd. Yeah, really good guy. We can both vouch for him up here. So that should be a really interesting conversation. Um, and, and look for more information on that. If not, thank you very much to Senator Burr and to everyone in the room. Thank you very much.